Hello, and welcome to our fourth presentation on SB2. My name is Mark Nagel, and I am a law enforcement consultant assigned to District 1. This is session four, and we are going to pick up where session three ended. That is at the point where the investigation is complete and all relevant information is uploaded to Mark 43. And I'm going to cover the district map, which is going to be the map of California, how we broke it down into four districts. I'm going to talk a little bit about the decertification process and how that's going to look. I'm going to cover this newly established Peace Officer Standards Accountability Advisory Board. Uh, talk a little bit about the post commission and how they are involved in SB2, uh, the administrative law judge, and finally cover some publications we are going to make uh, upon decertification. This is the post regional map. Uh, this is where the state is broken into 10 regions. Um, this is where our regional consultants are assigned to an area and they work with all the agencies in their respective areas to handle all matters uh, involving post. We're going to adopt and use that same concept for SB2. That is where a law enforcement consultant or consultants are assigned to an area and they're going to work with all the agencies in their area. But because SB2 is different and has a different purpose, we had to come up with a different plan for how to break down the state. So here's some thoughts that went into uh, how we came upon this map. First, we have four professional conduct bureaus. Um, they cover the state and we are calling these districts. We can't call them regions because we are still using the regional map and it would be just too confusing to have, for example, two regions ones or two region twos. So these are gonna be districts and we have district one through four. The stars on the map uh, represent the administrative law judge offices, and I'll talk a little bit further uh, in the presentation about the ALJ and what they're going to do. But it worked out pretty well because there are four ALJ offices in the state. They are Sacramento, Oakland, Los Angeles, and San Diego. So that worked out pretty well, having four professional conduct bureaus and four ALJ offices. I wanted to break down these districts with a little more detail. Uh, right here is Professional Conduct Bureau 1. I've isolated the counties assigned to that area. Um, these are the seven counties uh, with 119 agencies and a sworn and reserve population of a little over 20,000 people. I've also listed the names and email of the bureau chief and consultants assigned to this district. If you would take a moment and if you're assigned to this district, uh, please note uh, my email and Brian South's email. Just wanted to make that available to you. Uh, please send us an email with your contact information uh, so we can have that for future reference. This is Professional Conduct Bureau 2, District 2. It consists of only one county, um, but it's obviously uh, much larger in terms of population. 72 agencies with a sworn and reserve population of almost 25,000. Again, the Bureau Chief and the consultants assigned to this district are listed. Uh, please reach out to them as they will be your consultants uh, for this area. And if you have any questions, uh, please uh, send them an email. Continuing going north, this is the central area up to the Bay Area. Um, many more counties uh, listed there on the left, 208 agencies with a sworn and reserve population of 19,504. Uh, once again, your consultants and bureau chief are listed uh, on the right. And finally, this is uh, Professional Conduct Bureau 3, our District 3. Uh, many more counties uh, listed there on the bottom, 207 agencies with a sworn reserve population of 18,549 and with the Bureau Chief and consultants and their email listed uh, for you. Again, please uh, reach out to them as we proceed 
and they'll be available to you for any questions you may have regarding SB2. So getting back to this decertification process, I'm going to talk a little bit further about the post investigation and the panel review with the law enforcement consultants. Uh, there may be a, an idea out in the field uh, that the board and the commission are going to hear every single case presented to uh, the division. That's not necessarily true. I'll explain why uh, as we as we proceed. Um, but that that may not be the case uh, going forward. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Peace Officer Standards Accountability Advisory Board. I'm going to explain and cover who's on that board and and what their duties are. I'm going to talk about the post commission. Yes, you see them twice. Uh, they are involved uh, twice in this process and talk a little bit further about the administrative law judge and what they are going to do. You'll notice uh, a few of these uh, boxes uh, say recommendation. Uh, there is only one group that says decision, and it's only one group that has the power and the authority to decertify or suspend, and that is the post commission. And I'll explain why uh, in further slides how that's going to happen. Let's begin at the division level. Uh, that is the, the level of the post investigation and the panel review. So as I mentioned before, we are at the point where the agency has concluded their investigation. Everything that's needed has been uploaded to Mark 43 and the consultant uh, is ready to uh, work with the division panel to review this case to determine one of two things. At this level, the division is only going to recommend decertification or not. We are not going to recommend suspension, so it's either one or the other. So on the right, if the case does not rise to clear and convincing evidence and it does not meet any of the definitions of misconduct, it's pretty straightforward. There'll be no further action and the division will close this case. However, on the other hand, if the case does meet clear and convincing evidence and it does meet one of the definitions of misconduct, uh, four things are going to happen. We are going to notify the officer in a certified letter that the investigation is complete, the reasons for decertification, we're going to detail this decertification process. And I wanted to highlight this next uh, box, and that is the method for review. In other words, an appeal. The subject officer who we are recommending decertification has a right to request for review, and that's going to determine the next steps in this process. This is the newly created request for review form or the appeal. Uh, it is up to the subject officer to fill out this form if they desire a request for review. But here's the important part. The officers received a certified letter with a recommendation from the division to decertify. If this form and the request is not received in 30 days, the decision to decertify stands. In other words, if it's not received, the officer will be decertified. However, if we do receive this form, this will start this request for review process. The voluntary surrender is another option. Uh, this is a newly created form. Um, this is also filled out by the officer uh, it has the same effect as revocation. In other words, once this is filled out and submitted, this is irrevocable. There's no appeal to voluntarily surrendering. And once an officer voluntarily surrenders, uh, their name will go in the NDI and their name will be posted on the post website, which I'll show a little bit further in this presentation. So why would someone voluntarily surrender? Well, there could be a number of reasons. One is district attorney's offices ask for this to be an option in a plea deal uh, agreement. 
where, for example, it, we, they will not charge for a felony. They'll bring it down to a misdemeanor, but you will voluntarily surrender your certificate. Uh, that's one example. Or it could be an arrangement or an agreement between the officer and their agency or between the officer and post or really for any other reason. But again, once this form is received, it has the same effect as revocation. So assuming the officer does submit the request for review form, it's going to start these next steps, this next process of review. And the first stop is to this newly created Peace Officer Standards Accountability Advisory Board. This board is completely separate from POST and separate from the commission. They are their own body and they have their own uh, duties and obligations. So who is going to be on the Peace Officer Standards Accountability Advisory Board? Well, it consists of nine members, two of which are current or former sworn, and the remaining seven are members of the public. The first is a current or former sworn command level officer selected by the governor's office. The next is current or former sworn management level officer with internal affairs experience. Next would be an attorney with oversight experience selected by the governor's office. The next two, it is highly recommended. They are subjects of wrongful use of force by a peace officer or they've had family members killed by a peace officer for unlawful use of force. Again, selected by the governor's office. And finally, the last four, two are members of a nonprofit community-based organization, and two are members of an academic institution. Two are selected by the governor's office and two by the Senate. As it stands today, uh, there has only been one member selected in the nonprofit uh, category, but we anticipate after January that the remaining members uh, will be selected for this board. All of the members are uh, going to go through a 40-hour decertification training course. That course is to include the decertification process, internal investigations, evidentiary standards, use of force standards, and local disciplinary processes. Uh, that course is already put together. Uh, Post has created that course. And once the members are selected, we will schedule that course for the members of the board. So this is the first stop in the decertification process. Again, that is if the subject officer has asked for a request for review. So the advisory board is the first stop in this request for review. And the process is going to be where the law enforcement consultant is going to present before the board a summary of findings. The officer or representative can be present and they can make a written or oral statement. This is a public hearing and it's non-evidentiary. Uh, so what's going to happen is after the presentation and the board may ask uh, limited questions of the officer. The board will then take a majority vote. And again, this is a vote to make a recommendation. And the recommendation can be to revoke, suspend, or take no action at all. So again, this is the first stop in the process. It is a recommendation and it will proceed to the next step, which is before the commission. Continuing along the process of the request for review, this will be the second step, which is the first stop at the post commission. And this is the makeup of the post commission. There's 18 members. Uh, the first 10 are sworn, consist of sheriff, a chief, or an officer, peace officer, sergeant, or below, or a sergeant or below with experience presenting post courses, an elected officer from a county, an elected officer from a city, two members of the public, 
an educator, Speaker of the Assembly and the Senate Pro Tem, and finally the Attorney General. Very similar to the presentation before the board, uh, it's going to be the same before the commission. A law enforcement consultant will submit their summary of findings. The commission will review the board's recommendation. Uh, again, the officer or representative can be present and make a written or oral statement. This is also a public hearing and non-evidentiary. But at the conclusion of the commission, it looks a little bit different. In order for the commission to take action against a certificate, there needs to be a two-thirds or higher vote to take action. If it does not reach two-thirds, this case is closed at this point at this level. Uh, but again, to continue on the request for review process and for the commission to take any sort of action, it needs to be two-thirds or higher of the commission members. Continuing with the request for review process, this is after the first stop at the commission where the vote to take action is two-thirds or higher. It then moves on to the administrative law judge. At the administrative law judge hearing, this is a little bit different. This one is where evidence can be presented. Uh, once again, the ALJ will receive findings by the division. They will review the commission's determination uh, of action and what they voted on. Uh, but this one, you can introduce witnesses, introduce evidence. Uh, and again, this is a public hearing as well. At the conclusion of the ALJ hearing, a recommendation will be made and delivered to the next stop along the request for review process, which is the final stop at the commission. This is the last step along the request for review process. This is the second time uh, presenting before the post commission. At this point, the commissioners have already heard the case. They're familiar with uh, the incident. Uh, at this point, they're going to review the administrative law judge findings and recommendations. And once again, take a two thirds or higher vote to take action against a certification. If that vote passes, uh, post will decertify the officer. We will notify the uh, peace officer in a certified letter. We'll notify the agency. We're going to publish their name on a post website. And again, their name will be placed in the National Decertification Index. This is an example of what um, it will look like when we publish names. This is the decertification list. Um, I just filled in some random uh, names and information. Um, there actually is a last name column. I just couldn't fit it on the screenshot. But there will be a last name, first name, and the type of action that was taken against the officer, whether it be revocation or suspension. If it's suspension, it will list the terms and the length of time. Um, this will also include voluntary surrenders. So if an officer voluntarily surrenders, uh, that will also be listed on the type of action. Uh, the agency will be listed and SB2 uh, indicates uh, that a basis will be listed for the action. And we will just list the categories of misconduct uh, which were the basis for the certification. So this is an overview or a summary of the decertification process. But it's really at this point here where this can go uh, different directions. At this point, once again, the law enforcement consultant, bureau chiefs, the division legal counsel will review the agency investigation and make a determination. They will either recommend decertification or not. But it's really up to the subject officer what will happen next. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, 
the advisory board and the commission and the ALJ might not hear every case that's presented because it depends on if the subject officer wants to request a review or appeal. So if that form is received within 30 days, that review process will begin with the advisory board, with the commission on the first stop, the administrative law judge, and then finally back to the commission. So when you look at this all together, if an officer requests a review, the case is really being looked at five different times by different boards, different people to ultimately get to a decision. This concludes the session four presentation. The post website for SB2 is listed on the screen as well as the QR code uh, for that very same website. If you have any questions, please reach out to the SB2 team or you're welcome to email me uh, as well. Um, Mark Nagel, law enforcement consultant assigned to District 1. And I thank you for your time.